Let's go to our lesson now. The subject of the sanctuary. God drew the plan. And I invite you to turn with me. And for those at home, we'll be covering this lesson during this presentation now. It's got the Lord handing a set of blueprints down to man. The sanctuary, the temple. Why do we dedicate a lesson to this subject? This is a Revelation seminar. In other words, a lot of what we share is in Revelation. We've spent several nights dealing with some foundations through the Bible because, let me re repeat, out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 can be found almost word for word in other places of the Bible. The vision of Revelation seems to take place in a heavenly temple. The very first chapter is Jesus appears there standing what? among seven golden candlesticks. Later in Revelation, you see the altar of incense. Again in Revelation, you'll see the Ark of the Covenant. Again in Revelation, it talks about the courtyard. It seems like John is being taken through this heavenly temple and being given the visions. When you read Ezekiel, same thing. Isaiah's first vision, Isaiah chapter 6, says, In the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he was sitting on his throne with a cherubim around his throne. Not a golden box, but the very Shekinah glory, God's dwelling place in the heavenly sanctuary. And so the whole vision of Revelation seems to transpire in this enormous heavenly dwelling place. Now God gave Moses a plan for a miniature so that we could learn something about how he saves us. Number one. What did God ask Moses to build? Answer, why don't you read it with me? It's right there in that verse in Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Now, when Solomon dedicated his temple, he said, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. Was God uh, needing a mobile home? And so he said, build me a place to hang my hat. I have nowhere to sleep. No. He wanted to reveal himself among them. That's what he meant by dwell among them. You know, a good Christian minister does not just tell people what to do, but he exemplifies what to do. He disciples. Jesus did not just preach to people. He lived among them, demonstrating Christianity. God wanted to demonstrate how he saves us through this three-dimensional illustration, which brings us to question two. What did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary? Answer? Thy way, say it with me, why don't you? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great as God, our God? Thy way, thy will, the way that God saves us is demonstrated in the sanctuary. Now, I understand different people learn different ways. Some people are auditory. That means they hear something and they analyze what they hear. They're big listeners. Those people typically are good readers, too. They read a lot, auditory people. Then you've got your people that are kinesthetic. They want to know how something feels. They're the touchy-feely people. They're the ones who are always hugging everybody. A lot of charismatic people are kinesthetics. It's true. In the charismatic churches, it's a very emotional feeling church. I used to be part of that. The first church I went to was a charismatic church. Very touchy-feely. Some people are visual. They like to visualize things. They, they've always got a very active mental screen in their mind, and they're always picturing things. Now, some folks have accused me of having a good memory. I really have a lot of videotape in my mind. I'm not good with numbers and letters, but I have pictures in my mind. You tell me a story, I'll visualize it, I'll never forget it. Uh, and I can remember faces, but I have trouble sometimes with the names because I can't visualize a name. So uh, I'm a visual person. God knows a lot of people learn through visual illustrations. You know how many times in the Bible Jesus said, come and see? Read the Gospel of John chapter 1 and look at how many times there's reference made to visual. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If I be lifted up, you know, you shall see the Son of Man, uh, 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 angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. All through that chapter, see, 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 see. God knows that most of what comes into our minds, whether you are kinesthetic, I don't know what kind of person you are. Some of you already know. Whether you are auditory or visual, most people still get most of their information through their eyes. God knows that. So he made a visual aid to teach them how he saves us. It's called the sanctuary. 
You find it in the Old Testament. Incidentally, there are about seven sanctuaries. Doesn't God always work in cycle of sevens? In the New and the Old Testament, you must understand the sanctuary to understand the Bible. And yet I find as I visit a lot of different churches, and I've shared with you before, I've got friends in many different denominations. I've studied with and preached in many different denominations. And I believe there are good people in many different denominations. But I found a very strange silence on the subject of the sanctuary from the Bible at large in churches. And it's cover to cover in the Bible. First of all, there was three physical sanctuaries. You had the temple that Moses built. It was a portable tabernacle. Incidentally, three words. Tabernacle, temple, sanctuary, all the same thing. Tabernacle means dwelling place. The mobile sanctuary that Moses built in the wilderness was a portable tabernacle, a portable tent, portable temple. Then Solomon built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was uh, David amassed the wealth and the design, the beautiful, spectacular temple that lasted hundreds of years that was finally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Gold and wallpaper, bronze and marble without number. It was just a beautiful edifice. It was destroyed and rebuilt and refurbished by Ezra, Nehemiah, and later Herod the Great kind of refurbished it. Three earthly temples. Then you've got three other kinds of temples, more spiritual on earth. Paul says, what don't you know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How many of you remember hearing that? Wait until I show you our model a little later. The Bible says you collectively are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not just you individually, but the church together is the temple of God. You are living stones. Jesus is the foundation. Then the third temple that you find in the New Testament, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The body of Christ is called the temple too, isn't it? Then the last and the seventh temple is which one? Temple of God in heaven. God always saves the seventh for heaven, doesn't he? Oh, someone asked the question about seven heavens. Bible doesn't say there are seven heavens anywhere. Bible talks about a third heaven, and I'll write that down. I'll talk about it tomorrow night. I'm out of question time. All right, so you've got these different temples in the Bible. Once you understand the sanctuary, all kinds of things in the Bible start coming together. Number three, from what source did Moses obtain the blueprints for the sanctuary of what was the building a copy? Now we read there in Hebrews, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was admonished when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, he said, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown you in the mount. God gave Moses a pattern when he went up Mount Sinai. So who designed the temple? God did. Who designed Noah's ark? God gave Noah the dimensions. God's a great builder. Jesus was a carpenter. He likes to build. He's gone to build a mansion for you and me. Amen? Now, keep in mind when we're about to study the tabernacle, this is a symbol of a very real dwelling place of God in heaven where he is dealing with salvation and the sin problem. In the earthly temple, in the Holy of Holies, the very center, was an ark of the covenant. Inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. On the ark was the mercy seat. It was symbolic of the throne of God. The wallpaper had engravings of angels everywhere. On the ark, there were two covering cherub. Now, do you think God sits in a golden room up in heaven with golden wallpaper with two golden angels? Or are they real angels all around him? This represents a dwelling place of God where he is surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 real angels in heaven. On earth, it was just a few cubits across. In heaven, listen now, in heaven, the temple of God, the holy place where he dwells, might be five light years across. Comprehend that. This is where God dwells. That's why Solomon said, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. He's got wallpaper of living, moving angels. He doesn't have two golden angels on his, by his throne. You read there in Isaiah 6, he's got real beings that are alive, that are crying, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. So the model on earth is a little miniature of a very real dwelling place of God in heaven where he deals with sin. But some things are different from the earthly to the heavenly. You understand that? God does not have golden wallpaper. He does not have badger skin for his roof. Is everyone aware of that? See what I'm saying? There are, there are symbols, but they teach us very important lessons. 
Question number four. Now, we're going to go quickly through the furniture because I'm going to elaborate in just a minute. I want you to say the answers with me. What furniture was in the courtyard? The temple had three spots. Courtyard, holy place, most holy place. What furniture was in the courtyard? Answer A, the altar of burnt offerings. Answer B, the laver. Question number five. What furniture was in the holy place? Answer A, the table of shoe bread. B, the seven branch candlestick. And C, the altar of incense. Now, don't worry that I'm rushing because I'll elaborate in just a moment. Number six, what furniture was in the most holy place? Answer, one thing, the Ark of the Covenant. And then number question number seven, what was inside the Ark? The Ten Commandments. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I think you know that a camera lens is a little impersonal. That's why I want to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, and your comments. We also appreciate your prayer requests. Our office staff gathers every day to pray over each one of them. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. God bless you, and I thank you in advance. Let's go to our next screen here, and I wonder if we could bring out a model. I've got a visual aid here that we're going to look at very quickly that's going to help me teach the sanctuary. How many parts of salvation are there? Seven parts of salvation. No, three. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Now, those are big words, aren't they? Uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. The sanctuary had three rooms. The silver border, this is a symbol of the outer wall. I didn't have room to draw everything I needed here. This is the Holy of Holies. This represents the dwelling place of God. The whole purpose of the sanctuary is to get back to God. We have been separated from God by sin, okay? There was one door that you could enter on your way in. There was only one way. You would not pass fire hazard back then for the sanctuary. One way in, one way out. How many ways to heaven? One way. Do you know what Jesus said? I am the way. He's the only way. Jesus is the door. Now, as you study the sanctuary, even in the Old Testament, you're going to find Christ was everything. When you first came in, if you wanted to come to the Lord, the very first thing you needed was a lamb. You did not come empty-handed. You needed a sacrifice. You would come to the door. You would lay your hands on the head of this lamb. Confess this, your sins and the sins of your household. If you were a shepherd, you brought one of your own sheep. It had to be a perfect lamb. First year, without spot or blemish. A symbol of Jesus, the lamb of God, without spot or blemish. It was to be a male of the first year, incidentally. Then they would bring it inside and they had a stake with a cross on it where they tied the lamb and they would slay it. And I know this is very unpleasant, but it's in the Bible. The high priest had a very sharp knife. They would cut the juggler of the lamb and it would go limp instantly. As the blood drained, it died just about instantly. They would catch some of the blood of the lamb. They would drain all the blood out. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross, isn't it interesting they had a stake with a little cross to tie the lamb up? When Jesus died on the cross, he was pierced and all his blood was drained out too, wasn't it? Then they would put the lamb on the altar. That's the place of sacrifice. The first step on the way to God is what? Sacrifice. Three rooms. Justified in the courtyard, sanctified in the holy place, glorified in the most holy place. There were three doors you would pass through. Into the courtyard, into the holy place, and through the veil into the holy of holies. Okay? Three parts to salvation. You know the children of Israel had the same three. They were justified by the Lamb in Egypt. They were sanctified in the wilderness. Glorified when they crossed the Red Sea into, I'm sorry, the Jordan River, 
into the promised land, into the promised possession. Okay? Our first step in salvation is the Lamb. First step. You do not first keep God's law and then you're saved. First you accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Then He begins to change you. Amen? First step. Then there was a laver with water where they were washing. The word lavar. Anyone speak Spanish here? It means to wash. Laver. It was a place where washing took place. That's the Latin for it. And there was washing. This is baptism. First they would accept the Lord, the sacrifice of Jesus. And you notice you don't get baptized and then He dies for you. First thing is He dies for you. Then came baptism. You could not enter here unless you washed. And you know, you cannot be part of just our sanctification and part of the church family unless you go through the washing to enter the next phase. This is where the church is in the wilderness. This is once you have gone through the sacrifice, you're now going through a learning experience preparing for glorification. Three things were in the holy place. And let me stand off to the side so you can see this a little better. There was the lamp. There was the altar where they had a table with shoe bread. And it was built like an altar, but there was bread on it, holy bread. Twelve loaves, one for representing each of the twelve tribes. Then there was this altar of incense. And they would uh, put precious incense on here. And they used to arrange it so that the prevailing winds would carry the veil or carry the, the incense fragrance over the veil into the presence of the Shekinah glory of God in the holy place. And then, of course, the most holy place was the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, something I can't rush past, friends. The most important thing in this whole beautiful edifice, billions of dollars were spent by Solomon building the temple of God. Gold, hundreds of pounds, talents of gold. Probably thousands of pounds of gold, silver, bronze, marble, precious metals. It was the most lavish structure in the world during the time of Solomon. The whole thing was built in honor of the most priceless treasure, which was not the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was simply a box holding the most priceless treasure that they had. The most priceless treasure they had was the rocks in the box. Isn't that amazing? The greatest honor that they could bestow on any physical object in Palestine was the rocks with the finger of God inscribing His will. The law of God written on stone. The covenant. Now, do you know the old covenant was where God wrote His law on stone. The new covenant is the same law written in the heart. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. The law of God in our minds, in our hearts. That's the new covenant. Same law, same covenant that he speaks of different places, different promises. But God has never had a problem with his law. Matter of fact, this represented the throne of God. What was at the foundation of his throne? You remember when Jesus said, heaven and earth will have to pass away before one jot or tittle passes from the law. You know why he said heaven had to pass away? Because the original's up there at the foundation of his government. Matter of fact, you read that in Revelation chapter 11. I saw the temple of God open in heaven and the ark of the covenant was there in heaven. Now, if God's got it there in heaven, do you think it ought to be important here on earth? Yeah, it's amazing to me that people who take the name of Christ say the Ten Commandments don't matter. Oh, friends, that is such a dangerous doctrine. It doesn't matter if you're thinking you can keep it in your own strength. But the law is there because God wants us to know our need of Jesus. You take away the law, you realize what's sin. Where there's no law, there's no sin, right? No sin, who needs a lamb? The whole thing was you sacrifice the lamb so we can come into the presence of a holy God. You see, the whole thing is getting back to God. You had to have the blood of the Lamb. And incidentally, you can't see it because my pen faded, but they had a curtain. And it was made out of badger skin above the tabernacle. A badger was an unclean, vicious, ornery animal. Had good skin. And they would dye that badger skin red. That represents how all of this was under the red of the Lamb. And that badger... His skin being dyed red symbolized how you and I have our rebellious and unclean natures washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Everything about the sanctuary tells us about Jesus. Now follow me. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's the door. Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus says, I am the water, the living water, right? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus is the high priest that makes our prayers acceptable. We pray in whose name? In Christ's name. And Jesus is the rock. He said, He that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who builds on a rock. Well, what was the most prominent rock to the Jews?
the rocks in the box, the word of God, these words of mine, like building on a rock. It's a foundation, I believe. Christ is the law embodied. He came to fulfill the law. He lived it. The law is summed up, Paul says, in what? Love. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. It's not a bunch of restrictions. Even in the Ten Commandments, it says in the Second Commandment, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's the foundation for God's government. So everything about the sanctuary is telling us about Christ and how to be saved. Now, you know, not only, oh, I could go on and on. This is such a great study. The Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know every cell has basically three parts to it? And your body, digestive system, constantly consuming, sacrifices. When you eat, some of us sacrifice more often than others. The labor, it was for cleansing. Your body has a circulatory system that cleanses, right? In the holy place, you, you had the light of the body is the eye, Jesus said, right? If your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. The incense is like the spirit, the soul of man. Scientists don't even know how you think. In other words, what is a thought physical? When you take out one brain cell, do you take a thought out? Is that how that works? They don't know. So this is the spirit of man. They had food stored in the sanctuary. and we store food too. Some of us store more than others also. This represents the, the mind, the most important part. The holy of holies is your mind. This is where God dwells. God does not inhabit your elbow or your knee. God inhabits, and he does not inhabit your stomach. Even though some of us make that a God. He inhabits our minds, right? All right, so everything is here. Not only is Jesus the light, but you know what Jesus said to the church? You are the light of the world. Not only is Jesus the priest and the lamb and the high priest, Jesus said, we are to be a nation of kings and priests, right? Jesus said to the disciples, you give them something to eat. And so we have a responsibility to give the living bread to people. Remember when they fed the multitude? Jesus didn't hand them the bread. He gave it to the disciples and said, you give them something to eat. And so the church is also symbolized by this. You individually are the temple of God and you collectively are the temple of God. But something very interesting happened when Jesus died on the cross. No man was ever supposed to go in the holy place. There was only two times. Now, don't miss what I'm going to say. Only two times someone went in the holy place. Once a year, someone went into the Holy of Holies. I'm talking about the Holy of Holies here. Someone went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. It was the end of the Jewish year. It was at one minute, a time of judgment. The high priest went in and it was a judging of the people. They would confess their sins. They went through a ritual where they were cleansed from their sins. Because on a daily basis, when people brought their lambs and they caught a little of the blood from the lamb, they didn't have gallons and gallons of blood splattered everywhere. They kept it very clean. But they wouldn't take their finger. The priest would take his finger. He'd dip it in the blood from the lamb in a bowl. And he would touch a little of the blood on the horns of the altars or sprinkle it different places for different sacrifices. When the family confessed their sins on the head of the lamb, symbolically, they transferred their sins and their family's sins to the lamb. Just like when we accept the Lamb of God, He took our penalty, right? Then when that Lamb died, the sin was symbolically in the blood. The sins of all of Israel were stored in the sanctuary. At the end of the year, they had something called the cleansing of the sanctuary. They didn't get Formula 409 and start scrubbing the walls. It meant cleansing it from the sins of the people. They cleaned, they cleaned the apparatus on a daily basis. But it would be cleansed from the sins of the people at the end of the year. Now, I told you there were two times. 99% of the time, it was once a year at the end of the year. But there was one other exception. Now, don't miss this. When they first built the tabernacle in the wilderness, and when they first built Solomon's temple, and when they first built Hezekiah, or rather uh, Ezra and Nehemiah's temple, they went in to inaugurate it, to sanctify it, to activate it. Now, when was the heavenly temple activated? Remember when Jesus rose from the dead and Mary went to worship him? He said, do not detain me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. When Christ first died on the cross, he ascended to heaven, he entered into the presence of the Father. He went through the whole sanctuary when he first ascended and activated this heavenly temple. Because up until that point, there was no blood to offer. Now he's offering his own blood. See what I'm saying? And then he commenced his work as our high priest in the holy place. But do you know Jesus where he is now? Jesus is now entering as the high priest into the Holy of Holies because we're in the last age of the church. We're in the age of Laodicea. What does the word Laodicea mean? Judging of the people. We're in the last age of the church. Number eight. 
Why did animals need to be sacrificed in the Old Testament sanctuary services? Question? Answer? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Now, isn't that... How many of you are saddened when you think that all these animals had to die for the sins of the people? Does that bother you? Would it bother you if you lived back during that time... If you wanted forgiveness, just imagine that if you lived back then, if you wanted forgiveness for yourself and your family, you'd have to lay your hands on the head of a young, innocent, fluffy lamb, confess your sins. If you did not live by the temple where you could go right into the sanctuary, sometimes they had family altars, you would have to slay the lamb yourself. And you might have even named that lamb, might have played with your kids. That would have really hurt. Would it make it hard for you to sin to know that if you wanted forgiveness on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you'd have to kill a lamb for your sins? How much harder should it be when we consider that when we sin, we crucify the Son of God afresh, that it hurts Jesus when we sin? Should it be easier for us to slay the Lamb of God than to slay a sheep? They're cute, but you know, they're stupid. It should hurt us a lot more when we think about the Son of God and what it does to him when we sin. Number nine, how are animals sacrificed in the sanctuary service and with what meaning? Now we touched on this a little bit. He would put his head, hands on the head and it shall be accepted to make atonement for him and he'll kill it on the side of the altar northward. They'd tie it to that little cross stake and slay it. Just like Jesus was bound to the cross where he died and his blood was spilt. Number 10, when a sacrificial animal was offered for the entire congregation, what did the priest do with the blood? And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. Why seven times? What cycle of time does God establish in the Bible? It's the cycle of seven. It represents forgiveness for every day of the week. Now, you know, they used to have a special sacrifice just before the Sabbath began. And they had a special sacrifice at the end of the year. There were sacrifices for different occasions. And again, this is a whole study. But these things teach us about how God forgives us. Now, is it clear to everybody, can the blood of goats and bulls and lambs wash away our sin? What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you ever read there in Psalm 51? Turn with me. What does the Lord want from you and me? Does he want us to find a lamb and confess our sins on the head of a lamb? I did not have this in my notes, so it may take me a minute to find this. Psalm 51. This is the psalm where King David is praying a prayer of repent repentance for his sin with Bathsheba, killing Uriah the Hittite. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. We were talking earlier in our program about people being motivated by fear. What is a, a broken and contrite heart? That's a heart that is broken by love. When a person is motivated to serve Jesus as we see him hanging on the cross, is it fear or is it a broken heart because we love him so much? When we see how much he sacrificed that we might live, for us to turn back to a life of sin, it's just hard to comprehend. Love needs to be the reason that we are motivated to act when we see him there on our cross. Based on the sanctuary services, in what two major capacities does Jesus serve his people? What fantastic benefits do we receive from his loving ministry? Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. Seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, some people have thought, well, Jesus doesn't know what it's like to be like us. Was Jesus tempted like we're tempted? Yes, he was. I believe that Jesus came into the world with all the same propensities and tendencies that he had inherited from the degenerate humanity that you and I wrestle with. 
Otherwise, the Bible could not say he was tempted in all points as we are. Do not think that Jesus was never tempted. The Bible says he was taken into the wilderness and he was tempted. Was there a struggle in his heart? Oh, yes. Do you think there was a temptation for him to say this human race is not appreciating me? When he was in the garden, he sweat great drops of blood and he prayed in agony and said, Father, if there's any other way to save these people, then show me what that way is. But there was no other way and he submitted. He resisted the temptation to walk away from us because he loved us too much. And he said, not my will, thy will be done. He submitted himself to the Father. Christ was tempted, just like you and I are tempted. You might be thinking, oh, Doug, well, Jesus doesn't know what it's like to try and quit smoking. Jesus doesn't know what it's like to try and get off chocolate. They didn't have it back then. You know, he does know because there are really three temptations. Only three. How many times was Christ tempted? Three. The lust of the flesh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Eve fell in three categories. Jesus overcame in three categories. We all are tempted in one of three ways. There are a lot of mm, spectrum. There's a lot of division of those three categories. But it's all the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the three areas. And Jesus overcame in those three areas. And that's the same way you and I overcome. Amen? He overcame with a word in his heart. And that's how we overcome. Number 12. What six sublime promises does the Bible give us about the righteousness offered to us through Jesus? Answer A, he will cover our past sins and count us as guiltless. You know, when you first come to Jesus, he deals with completely wiping out your record of your past by grace. You're justified. Like when the prodigal son came home and he was wearing those filthy garments, the father wrapped a robe around him, that's justification. Answer B, we were created in God's image in the beginning. Jesus promises to restore us to God's image. He has to change our direction. You're converted. You know, follow me for a second here. This is conversion. It's very simple. You're going this way. You're living for yourself. You're going to destruction. You're on the wrong road. You really realize the Bible talks about two roads. There's really one road, two directions. The road gets wide, broad, and everybody goes down. And then you turn around and now the road gets narrow, straight, and you can go up. Everyone's on the road of life. It's what direction on the road are you going? Down the broad way or up the straight part? See? Now when a person's converted, I may have spent 50 years of my life walking in this direction. All of a sudden the Lord gets my attention and I'm converted. Do about face. Where am I? I'm at the same place I was a moment ago. But has something changed? My direction's changed. When a person's converted, they say, why am I still feeling the same? Well, you've changed directions now. You'll start gradually moving in a whole new direction. And does it take a little more effort to go uphill than down? How many of you have ever played on an escalator at a shopping mall? Fess up. Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one. How many of you have tried to go up the down escalator? How many of you were on the down escalator for a while before you realized it was an accident? I wouldn't admit that if I were you. <laughs> How come I'm not going anywhere? But we've all played trying to go up the down escalator when we're younger, right? If you stand, now stay with me. If you stand on the down escalator, where do you go? Down, okay. If you walk up the down escalator, where do you go? Nowhere. If you want to get up the down escalator, what does it require? Extraordinary effort. You know, friends, there is effort involved in being a Christian. You know why? Because we are working against our natural selfish tendencies. You can get up the down escalator. But it's easier to just stand there. Now, you've heard of backsliding. If a person stands on the down escalator, see, our, our natures are like that escalator. We got this, this gravity that's pulling us down, this animalistic, selfish behavior, carnal nature, the flesh. And if you just stand there, you don't make any effort at all. You'll slide. Someone says, I don't remember when it was I started backsliding. You don't have to make effort. You can stand still and slide. If you want to be a Christian, you've got to change directions, look at Jesus, and move up. The Bible says we run the race, but we do it only with our eyes on Jesus. You cannot live the life of faith. You cannot go uphill without faith by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Don't focus on your feet on the escalator. You'll trip. Focus on your goal. All right, let's move along here. Oh, I've got to rush through my sublime points that I'm doing. Answer C, Jesus gives us the desire. He changes our heart. All things are made new. Answer D, Jesus by his miracles will cause us to happily do only the things that please him that please God. 
Answer E, he removes the death sentence from us by crediting us for his sinless life and atoning death. Answer F, Jesus assumes responsibility for keeping us faithful until he returns to take us to heaven. He's going to help us live the life, not only forgive the past, but power us for the future. Number 13, does a person have any role at all to play in becoming righteous by faith? Is there a role that we part participate in? Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will. We got a whole lot of people out there that are just thinking all you got to do is say, yes, I'm a Christian and I said a little prayer, and then they do not live the life of Christ. The Lord says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth. Jesus talked about a father that had two boys. He said, go work in my field. And uh, one boy said, I'm not going, but he was sorry and he went. The other one said, I'm on my way, but he never went. And Jesus said, which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said, well, the one that finally repented and went. Paul, or I'm sorry, James tells us that we should not be hearers of the word only, but doers. I believe that the word of God is, is the perfect ideal we are to all aim for. Not to just look at, but to do. To put the things into practice in our lives. Can you do that in your own strength? You know, the only way you can live the Christian life this is where so many miss the boat. You cannot be a Christian without dying first. You have a problem with your temper? I've never seen a corpse get mad at a funeral. The reason that we're often hurt is because someone has offended that old selfish nature, that pride. But when you're crucified with Jesus, you don't have it anymore. Are you concerned when people talk about you? I've never seen a person offended when they're dead. Done a lot of funerals, never seen anyone jump up and lose their temper. You insecure, unhappy about what you possess or how you look. You know, when a person's dead, they don't care much about how they look. They don't care much about what they possess. The reason we're unhappy so often is because the old nature is still alive. Jesus said, whoever would lose his life will save it. Whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. You try and live for yourself, you're going to lose everything. If you just give up and give it all to Jesus and take up your cross and follow him, incidentally, where did Jesus take his cross? To a crucifixion. If you're taking your cross and you're following Jesus, where do you think you're going? To your crucifixion. Now, here's the good news. You're not to stay dead. We've all met Christians who are crucified with Christ and they're still dead, too. They want you to be dead. They look like they're on the way to a funeral, baptized in pickle juice, right? Christians are to be happy. Why? Because we live a new life. We die daily, but then we're born again to live a new life. And we can say, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I'm living a new life. We're resurrected with Jesus. Jesus didn't stay dead. And if we follow him to the crucifixion, we're also resurrected with him. And baptism is a symbol of that. A new life. You don't have to worry about the old person anymore. Not only the guilt and the sin, you don't have to worry about being ashamed, you don't have to worry about what shall I eat or what shall I drink or where will I be clothed or what are people going to think of me because you're walking with God and you're concerned about eternal things. You know, friends, it is so liberating to be really converted. It's so liberating to think I don't need to worry about what everyone else worries about. I need to worry about what God thinks of me. And that doesn't mean once you're converted you'll never have that old nation, nature try to resurrect itself. That's why Paul said, I die how often? You know, you get out of bed every morning. I get on my knees and I pray. And I pray that that old Doug Batchelor will not come out of the coffin. And that Christ can now live... Why do you say amen, dear? <laughs> and that Christ... <laughs> Christ will live out his new life in me. She saw the old Doug Batchelor get out of the coffin one day, evidently. <laughs> All right, number 16. Are you willing to accept the truth? that may be new to you as God reveals it. Are you willing to follow where Christ leads? Are you willing, friends, to be crucified with Jesus and to live a new life, to be a new creature? Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. 
Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I think you know that a camera lens is a little impersonal. That's why I want to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, and your comments. We also appreciate your prayer requests. Our office staff gathers every day to pray over each one of them. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. God bless you, and I thank you in advance.